Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our Meet the Researchers panel. My name is Nahom Daniel. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington, and I'll be the moderator for this evening. As you can see from the title, this event is going to be about community-led HIV research and COVID-19 vaccine efforts for East African populations in King County. This event is made possible by the YMCA, and it's meant to be interactive, so please put any questions you have in the chat, and they'll be answered later in a later section. Now let's move on to the overview. So just giving a brief overview of this event, first I'm going to be introducing the collaborating organizations and a quick overview of the speakers I'll be presenting today. From then we'll move on to a local community-based HIV effort in Project Rambe, which will be presenting their findings. Afterwards, we'll move on to local community-based COVID-19 efforts with two presentations, one from the Ethiopian Community Center and one from Living Well Kent. From then on, we'll move on to a moderated question and discussion section led by me. And afterwards, we'll have an open Q&A where you can all have your questions answered. And finally, we're just gonna be wrapping up the event and leaving out any information for you guys. Now, moving on to our collaborating organizations. So this event wouldn't be possible without the support of these collaborating orgs, including the Ethiopian community in Seattle, the University of Washington, Living Well Kent, Fred Hutch, and the Center for AIDS Research. So I just wanna take a quick moment to thank you for your involvement. Now let's move on to our speakers. So here's just a brief overview of our speakers today. I'm gonna to give them formal introductions later prior to their presentations, but for now just unmute and say hello when I call your name. So presenting today, we have Dr. Rena Patel. Hello, everyone. Shukri Hassan. Hi, everyone. Farah Mohammed. Hello, everyone. Rahel Schwartz. Hi, everyone. Sophia Benaflu. Hi, everyone, and glad to be here with you. And Hoda Abdullahi. Hello, everyone. Okay, thank you all. Now we can move on to our first presentation, which is about HIV research being done locally with Project Harambe. So this project is led by Dr. Rina Patel. Dr. Patel is an infectious diseases and HIV physician and assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at the International Clinical Research Center in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. In addition to seeing patients, she conducts myth message research using both qualitative and quantitative tools in HIV and reproductive health in Seattle, Washington, Kenya, and South Africa. Prior to joining the University of Washington, she was the assistant professor in infectious disease at the University of California, San Francisco, where she completed her infectious disease training. Dr. Patel completed her medical school and residency at Stanford University, MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health, and MPhil in Sociology from the University of Cambridge. She also previously has worked in India, Tanzania, Ghana, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. Shukri Hassan is a research coordinator in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the Department of Medicine at the University of Washington. She is currently assisting with HIV research using mixed methods techniques in Seattle, Western Kenya, and South Africa. Shukri has significant experience conducting qualitative research and previously conducted maternity and neonatal health research with the Somali community in King County. A recent University of Washington graduate, she tends to pursue a medical degree and can continue conducting research with Seattle's East African community. Farah Muhammad is a founder and director of Billy Consulting, a consulting firm that does research, translational, and transcreational community outreach and education. Farah also works at Seattle and King County Public Health, where he contributes to environmental health regulations and education in King County. Farah is a member of the Community Leadership Board at the National Resource Center to guide and inform core activities of National Resource Center on COVID-19 response and mitigation efforts. Farah has a master's degree of public health and social work degree from the University of Washington. Finally, we have Rahel Schwartz, which is, who is the Health Equity Director at the YMCA, facilitating and coordinating healthy living programs and implementing chronic disease prevention programs to increase the knowledge base on causes and interventions to reduce health disparities in underserved communities. She's a facilitator for the YMCA's Diabetes Prevention Program, Actively Changing Together, Live Strong, and Pearls Program, and a certified fitness instructor. 
actively engaging in the Harambi project, serving as co-investigator, a member of the CIFAR Community Consultative Group, a co-chair for the Ethiopian Community Health Board, and a member of the Health Equity Community Advisory Council at Seattle's Children's Center for Diversity and Health Equity and the Institute for Translational Health Services. So, Project Harambe, take it away. Thank you, Nahum. We would like to express our gratitude to the YMCA of Greater Seattle for inviting us to present our Harambe work and helping raise the profile of African immigrant communities in the US. We will be presenting on our second stage of the Harambe project known as Harambe 2.0. Harambe is a Kiswahili word that loosely translates to community coming together to address an issue. Today, Rahel Schwartz, Farah Mohammed, and I will be speaking on behalf of our larger team. First, we would like to acknowledge and thank our community partners, the Ethiopian Health Board housed under the amazing larger organization called the Ethiopian Community in Seattle, the Somali Health Board, which has been leading local and state level policy changes for immigrants and health-related issues, and the Eritrean Health Board, a true grassroots organization working hard for its community members. We would also like to acknowledge our University of Washington study team, Najma, Nahom, Giamar, Reina, Roxanne, who have all contributed invaluably to this work. We are very proud of this academic community partnership and we'll be discussing more details in the second half of our presentation. Lastly, we have a land acknowledgement here to recognize the native communities who reside on this land we live and work on today. For background, we want to highlight that African board individuals face a disproportionately high HIV burden. They only account for 2% of King County's population, but 10% of the, the new HIV cases. As this graphic shows, foreign born black males have twice the HIV rates as US born or African American males. And the HIV rate in foreign born black females is 20 fold out of the US born or African American females. Often, African born individuals are getting diagnosed with HIV late in the disease process but once engaged in care, they have as good or even better outcomes compared to their counterparts. Therefore, the key bottleneck on HIV prevention and treatment continuum for African-born individuals is early HIV detection. In the first phase of our Harambe project, my team members conducted a mixed methods research service project where they held many health fairs in residential complexes housing large numbers of African-born individuals. For integrated HIV testing, they offered attendees point of, care, point of care screenings, not only for HIV, but also for hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, and more. They had over 50% uptake of HIV testing during these many health fairs. But through our qualitative work and discussions with the community partners, we learned that we would, only, we learned that we would need to focus on HIV-related stigma reduction first before offering the HIV testing. For the second phase of our work, Harambe 2.0, we conducted formative work using qualitative study methods. Our aims were to better understand the HIV-related stigma, but also intersectional stigmas with the ultimate goal of developing a stigma reduction intervention to implement in our communities. We conducted key informant interviews with the community leaders, health professionals, and people living with HIV from our communities. We conducted the focus group discussions with diverse community members, including religious leaders, other community leaders, and lay community members. For the focus group discussions, we do not explicitly recruit persons living with HIV in order to minimize the risk of inadvertent disclosure or trauma. Key interviews were conducted in person. However, focus group discussions were conducted through Zoom meetings due to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The interview guide for the key informant interviews covered several domains, including interactions with the US healthcare system, barriers to health screening, stigma, intersectional stigmas affecting HIV testing behaviors, and decreasing stigmas around HIV or other health screenings. The focus group discussion guide also included a focus on selecting appropriate stigma reduction interventions for the community. For data analysis, we, we use inductive coding and thematic analysis based on consensus. Through our thematic analysis, we identified the following dominant themes. For main theme number one, we discovered that not only HIV-related stigma, but also intersectional stigmas influence HIV testing behaviors. We wish to highlight how the intersecting identities of race, ethnicity, Immigrant status and having a non-English language preference creates additional layers of stigma and barriers to HIV testing. For our main theme number two, we identified the theme that our communities are rich in resources and resilience factors. Social cohesion is strong, religious leaders are key gatekeepers in our communities, and there's a wealth of community resources such as health boards and community centers, and we use culturally rich ethnic and social media. These resources can be leveraged to help improve HIV testing. 
Lastly, for main theme number three, fundamental cultural and religious beliefs towards preventative care and complex Western healthcare systems creates barriers to preventing health, to utilizing preventative healthcare and overall health seeking behaviors. Now, in the second half of this presentation, we want to focus on the lessons we have learned in building the community partnerships that we have for this Harambe work. Our three lead community partners are the Ethiopian Health Board, affiliated with the Ethiopian Community Center in Seattle, the Somali Health Board, and the Eritrean Health Board. Each organization is conducting amazing grassroots work for their respective communities. Additionally, each organization also partners with each other and other ethnic health boards and entities in the Seattle uh, area for broader policy changes as pertaining to immigrants. Building meaningful partnerships for this project has taken some hard work. Parties on all sides have had to invest in the process with time and money. Often for the University of Washington researchers, this meant building durable relationships founded on trust, which required being present and listening only at times. It also required them to be aware of the larger inequities in play with our communities and to respect that at times our priorities were not related to HIV. There is um, this interesting phenomena in any community work who is ultimately the community, who gets to define who is community and whose voices are heard, therefore. This is not something that we have solved, but it is something that we, we try to be very mindful of in our work. Arguably, the bedrock for our engagement with the UW research team has been through CBPR principles. Specifically, our team's collectively choice to focus on principles of equity, justice and sustainability. We attempted to ensure that all our interactions had these principles in mind. One thing that I think the UW research team has done better now than compared to before was include more of us affected members of the community in the actual study team. So my colleague Farah Mohammed, uh, who will be speaking later from the Somali Health Board, served as the research coordinator for the study team. Arguably, that was the beginning point for him to include the rest of us and to every major decision. We always work via consensus, working hard to honor each member's thoughts and priorities. This effort directly translated to implementation led by us partners. We conducted all the key informant interviews exactly how we wanted. Far led the focus group discussion training session with marked collaboration on best practices and way forward from all of the team members given marked experience and the community partners in conducting such activities. Our ultimate hope is that these processes result in a research process that is informed by the experience, expertise, and values of our local communities, increasing empowerment of all parties, and a sustainable partnership that directly strives for greater equity and health. And maintaining this partnerships in a meaningful manner takes continued efforts. Over the last four years, we have collectively established guiding principles to ensure meaningful, enduring, and mutually beneficial community partnerships. First, we have established our fiscal priorities as a collective group in an unequitable manner so that each of the three partner receives similar funding support and that over half of the budget goes directly to our community partners. Second, our research team has equitable representation from our communities on our own terms so that meeting times are dictated by our schedule since many of us are already working one to two other jobs. We are included uh, as a co-investigators or grant applications and co-authors on publications. Third, decisions about the project will continue to be made through consensus, which I am sure many of you will know it's not easy when dealing with a continuous, uh, a contentious issue. Fourth, the UW research team has worked hard to support us to be the ones leading the work, whether it's presentations or determining the next steps of our work. 
For example, for the National Institutes of Health, NIH National Ending the HIV Epidemic Presentation, Dr. Bayan Farah and I presented along with Dr. Rina on this project. Though we are proud of this partnership, it would be disingenuous of me to not suggest that there are some shortcomings or opportunities for growth of this partnership. More work remains to be done to make this partnership more bi-directional so that these researchers can better help our communities. Perhaps we need to think harder about how to use their help. From the first time Dr. Rina met with me, I was clear that our communities have many health priorities other than HIV, such as diabetes, mental health, COVID, or youth violence. We've also agreed as a partnership that we would leverage the HIV work to work on many other health needs facing our communities. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure we are getting there, so we need to think harder about how we do that better collectively. Similarly, how can those in academia or, or public health better advocate for issues most important to us? I'm not sure that we have figured this out in our partnership. Lastly, from the uh, academic or UDEP side, the leadership for this work remains with Dr. Rina and Roxanne. Given the depth of health professionals in our communities, it is not acceptable for the leadership to not change and have people from our community be the faces of this work on the academic side too. I'm very hopeful that we are at that cusp soon, but it's something that is this partnership needs to actively cultivate. Thank you, Rahel, for sharing your thoughts. I will be first to acknowledge that as proud as I am of this partnership, there is still long way for us to go to reach our ideal partnership. Here we transition to our future direction for Harambe 3.0. Provided that we get funded, sustaining the relationship and partnerships we have built with the Ethiopian, Somali and Eritrean communities to reduce HIV related and st intersectional stigma is our top priority. In our third phase, we plan to work with religious leaders from different faiths and have already started building partnerships with some of the sites identified on the map of King County. Our first aim is to adapt and better test Project Faith, a faith-based HIV stigma reduction intervention that was first developed and implemented in Ghana and later adapted in Alabama for Black rural churches. Project Faith includes eight modules offered in a workshop format. We plan to further adapt Project Faith for our local community's needs. For example, by including emphasis on Islam and Quranic verses and for a focus group on, in, for, and for a focus on intersectional stigmas and, just, and not just HIV related stigma. We strongly believe that to truly address HIV in our communities, we must head on address all intersecting identities that perpetuate inequities in our communities. Our second aim is to conduct a pilot step which cluster randomized trial by combining our adapted version of Project Faith with the integrated HIV testing that we implemented in Harambe 1.0 project. We are highly indebted to our community partners, NIH funding, UWCFA, and Student Frontiers for their invaluable contribution. Thank you. Back to Noham. Thank you all for the excellent presentation on a project that I hold dear to my heart. So now let's move on to local COVID-19 vaccination efforts. So our first presenter is a representative from the Ethiopian community in Seattle, sharing some of their vaccination efforts. Sophia is executive director of the Ethiopian community in Seattle. Before she joined ECS, Sophia worked for international nonprofits Oxfam and CARE. While working for Oxfam, Sophia managed a global program named R4, Rural Resistance Training, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and later in Boston, Massachusetts. With CARE, Sophia was a senior technical advisor on climate change and resilience providing fundraiser and technical support to programs. 
Prior to joining the nonprofit sector, Sophia worked in the insurance industry in Ethiopia, heading underwriting, reinsurance, and marketing departments. Sophia graduated from Addis Ababa University with a BA in management and public administration. And Sophia has a diploma in general insurance from the Chartered Insurance Institute of London and is a certified program management professional. Now I hand it over to Sophia to present. Thank you, Naho. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here today to, do, to share our vaccine efforts. Um, but before I do that, I would first like to introduce you a bit to Ethiopian community in Seattle. Uh, so the Ethiopian community in Seattle has been in operation for more than 30 years. Uh, and um, we have different departments working on that. So. As you can see in the next slide, um, our vision is um, to preserve our rich Ethiopian heritage while also encouraging seamless integration of our communities into the American way of life. So this includes empowering our communities so that they can access uh, different social services. Uh, as you know, the immigrant community um, have hurdles and most of them are related to cultural and language differences. So we support communities to access opportunities. Uh, we help shape, guide and mentor the next generation of Ethiopians. So as I said earlier, the community has been in existence for more than 30 years and now we are working with the second generation. So uh, we support the next generation as well. Uh, to be educated, responsible, law-abiding, and respectable members of the society. Uh, and then we do have um, advocacy services. Uh, so this is related to, again, the community accessing education, jobs, and healthcare. Uh, so to do that, we work very closely with different public and private sectors in these sectors. Uh, so um, to look at the population size of the Ethiopian and East African communities. This is a bit old, um, it, it was in 2006, then, but it can give you an idea uh, how many from Ethiopia, Somali and Eritrea live in Seattle, King County and Washington. I won't read uh, each and every number, I just wanted you to see uh, how big the population is and it is fastly growing too. So as you can see in the next slide, uh, currently uh, the Ethiopian population is estimated to be 25 to 50,000. Uh, but uh, as you can see, it's really a big range. Uh, and this is because when people um, register uh, as part of the census, uh, they identify differently. So it's not easy really to, uh, uh, quantify the number of Ethiopians living here, but this is an estimate. And uh, we are located in Southeast Seattle uh, in Rainier Beach neighborhood. Uh, and this neighborhood is arguably uh, the most diversified in Seattle. Uh, so and there are um, a large number of immigrant communities in this neighborhood, uh, and most of which are from East African community. So when we look at the COVID-19 infection, um, it's really been high uh, amongst the Black American and immigrant communities. Uh, and uh, per um, Seattle and King County Public Health, uh, the towns in uh, South King County, the Auburn, Kent, Federal, Weberian, Renton, Tequila, and Sitak have had uh, three times higher uh, infection rates as compared to central Seattle. Uh, and uh, the same is true for the effect of uh, COVID-19. Uh, more have been hospitalized uh, and unfortunately died uh, because of the disease. So here, as you can see, hospitalization and rates are also three or four times higher in these areas. Um, so um, recognizing that we had been active the whole um, last year uh, and this some of this year too um, in responding to COVID. 
uh, and that included informing the community about um, how they can protect themselves, how can they protect others, uh, how can they access resources, uh, and more recently, uh, or how they can access uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, so um, early in February and March, when the uh, vaccines became available, um, you will all remember that it was really difficult to access them. The registration process was so difficult to navigate and uh, it became almost impossible for those who have limited English proficiency, uh, who do not have um, digital access. So it was really tough uh, to the point that uh, people kind of gave up. Uh, so we had to step in uh, to make sure that the community has access to the vaccine and especially elders because they were really suffering the most and the most at risk. Uh, so we uh, formed a partnership with YMC of Greater Seattle with Swedish and uh, with the city, uh, the firefighters, uh, and they came to the ECS uh, at different times and vaccinated about 700 uh, community members from East Africa. Uh, and before we uh, provided the vaccinations, uh, we had Zoom calls uh, in collaboration with our um, health board. Uh, and in those Zoom calls, the health board informed the community all about the vaccines because, you know, uh, there were a lot, lots of hearsays in the community about the vaccine, um, which are not necessarily science-based. Uh, so the board, which is really comprised of uh, medical professionals, uh, were able to explain to the community in the language that they understand uh, what the vaccine is all about and to debunk um, myths. So when we followed that with the vaccination events, it was a success because by then people kind of understood uh, what uh, the vaccine is, what is it really made of, uh, what are the risks, if any. Uh, so they came out um, in large numbers and got vaccinated. Thank you. A huge thank you to the Ethiopian community in Seattle for the important work being done regarding COVID vaccinations. So moving on to our last presenter, who is Hoda Abdullahi. Hoda is a longtime uh, Kent community member who now oversees the health and wellness department at Living Well Kent. She manages over seven projects that range from direct service to policy change. I'll now pass it over to Hoda to present on Living Well's Kent's COVID-19 strategy. Thank you, Nahom, and thank you anyone who's uh, tuning in today. Thank you for taking time out of your evening after work to come and hear our presentations. Uh, I just wanted to introduce Living Well Kent very quickly. Uh, Living Well Kent is a community-based organization that's united to achieve health equity through policy systems and environmental changes. Our aim is to address health disparities and increase opportunities for healthy lives. We build community through collaboration, communication, engagement, promotion, education, and advocacy. And today I kind of wanted to um, uh, present on our COVID strategy. Uh, so I think I have that on the next slide. So um, our strategy is an ongoing strategy. We constantly build upon it. Uh, so far we have four phases that we've went through. Um, the first phase was the initial outbreak of COVID. The number one thing that initially came was the fear in the community. Um, There's a lot of misinformation, there was a lot of um, unknown things that were around COVID. Um, there's a lot of panic in the community. So we stepped aside and took the time to gather as much information as we could to try to give as much accurate inf information to our community. Um, there was a lot of stress, especially when um, we started phasing into quarantining and um, a lot of our community members have like lost their jobs. Um, the, they have a lot of kids that were transitioning into online schools. It was a lot of a it was a lot of transition and um, a lot of worry from the community. So this time uh, we took it to be a little bit of um, support for our community and a little bit of a shoulder to cry on um, to make sure the mental health in our community was um, 
not worse than it could have been at that time. So uh, the initial outbreak, a lot of it was communication and speaking to community members, um, speaking to doctors and researchers and kind of relaying and filtering that information in a way that's culturally appropriate and responsive in a way that the community can understand, especially in their respective languages. Um, since we are a community-based organization and we are community-led, uh, we definitely do any program that we have, any services that we have, directly comes from the opinions and what the, the needs are of our community at that time. So we were doing a lot of, at least with me in the health and wellness department, we were doing a lot of um, policy work, but right then and there our community needed us. So we kind of transitioned a lot into direct services. Uh, like for example, one of the first things that we did was the community um, was a lot of people lost their jobs. So there's a lot of food insecurity. And one of the complaints we got from our community was that the boxes that when they went to the food bank, it was a lot of canned foods. It was foods that they didn't recognize, especially like East African food is very specific. It was a lot of foods that they weren't able to cook with. Um, they didn't recognize it and they weren't able to really feed their families with this supply of food. So uh, we partnered with local farms, uh, local um, halal stores and um, like local organizations to be able to get food that's culturally appropriate, uh, food that they recognize that they can feed their family with comfortably. Especially around the time during Ramadan, uh, uh, in, our, in our, a lot of East African communities, that's a time where it's very family-based and it's very important where you come at the end of the day and break your fast with your family. A lot of people were worried that they wouldn't be able to afford all of the food that it takes to cook um, every night. Um, so we partnered with local um, halal stores in Kent um, it, and we were able to have uh, get food boxes for them to give them and then eventually we transitioned into vouchers um, for the stores because we felt that gave the our community more autonomy where they're able to go and buy their own foods that they have and they're able to shop like like normal times and not feel like they're always getting a handout and um, also one of the things was uh, that the community spoke about was how expensive diapers were. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ever bought diapers or have a child, they are very expensive. So we partnered with other organizations like Eastside Baby and other like local donations. And we're able to do a food drive, a, a, a diaper drive every week that still goes on to this day. And we're able to provide diapers in all sizes to our community. One of the things too, we tried our best to is helping with job placement. It was very difficult just because there was a scarcity of jobs. Um, but the, our clients that we were able to get jobs, we were, um, that was a little bit successful, but it was really hard during um, COVID times, especially when it was the whole, like everything was shut down. Um, another thing that we really addressed during this time, we, we, I consider it direct service, is the mental health of our community. Um, because of quarantine, a lot of people felt lonely. We come from very communal societies and being, being disconnected from your community can be very detrimental. So we try to have as much online online community engagement nights. Um, we know that our community like a lot uses uh, Facebook and WhatsApp. So we try to encourage that as much uh, FaceTime, anything to like virtually connect with the community uh, because that definitely did affect uh, the mental health of people during that time. Uh, and then we transitioned to after this, um, well, all this is continuous, but the next phase that we had was vaccine information implementation. Before we started actually giving out the vaccine, um, we were speaking with different organizations that um, were like, like public health and we're gonna be uh, distributing the vaccine before the distribution even happened. We were trying to speak with them to make sure that the process is equitable. Um, and that was a lot of the like collaboration we we're doing before the vaccine. and before it even came out, we started education, like during our community engagement nights and during our one-to-one -one communications during food drives, we try to like kind of put the vaccine being available in the, in our community's radar. So it doesn't kind of feel like it's not coming, it's coming out of nowhere. Um, after the vaccine was available for um, our community, we partnered with, we made sure we partnered with doctors and nurses that look like them. One of our big partners was um, Dr. Ahmed from Somali Health Board. We were able to have uh, pop-up clinics with him. And it was really important because um, the registration process for getting the vaccine was very confusing. Even me, I was born here and I speak English perfectly and it was still very hard even for me. So our community members who may not be as tech savvy or may um, English is not their first language, it's very hard for them. It was even more difficult for them. So we kind of were that middleman where we would um, have one-on-ones with, um, with our community and have them registered prior to showing up to our pop-up clinics. 
And um, then they were able to just come in, show their like ID or whatever, and get the vaccine. They don't have to worry about the sign up and registration process. And uh, our, we got a really good response from that, especially with people who are really struggling. There's a lot of our um, community members that came to us and said that they tried to sign up for a vaccine and they just weren't able to and gave up. And that's a lot of people that could have got the vaccine if it wasn't for certain barriers um, that was um, around. And um, right now we're in kind of a post COVID support phase. Um, obviously COVID is not over, but um, we're kind of transitioning into back to normal life. But the first thing is we're still doing a lot of education around people who are still hesitant to get the vaccine. Understandably, there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of things of reason why communities are um, kind of hesitant. There's like medical racism. There's the, a lot of core community members said the vaccine came out so fast. We don't trust it. Um, a lot of our community members are religious, want to um, kind of just like use religious reasons and like they would rather pray and like things like that. So just a little bit of education, giving them facts, making sure that they understand all of the information before they make that decision. If they make that decision, then that's completely on them. But we at least have them be able to have the proper the proper information and be able to make an educated decision on their own. And also just transitioning back. A lot of our clients now are getting their jobs back or getting more jobs. A lot of them moved out um, and now they have to find new housing. So they're having a lot of um, transition, like a lot of transition support that they need, just like with the initial outbreak. Now it's kind of made a full circle where we're, they lost all those resources. We're trying to supplement that. And now we're helping them get all of those resources back. Um, and just another thing is just, like constantly updating the community, um, especially with the Delta variation and a lot of things going out. I know um, with like Johnson and Johnson vaccine, how there's a little um, stories about that and just keep constantly keeping the, uh, the community as educated as we are. When we get information, we're able to give it to them as soon as we receive that information. So that's a little bit of our COVID strategy. Um, we're only in phase four now. I'm sure there's gonna be a five, six, seven going forward. We're always adjusting and doing whatever we need for our community, whatever they need right now. So thank you for listening to me. I'm gonna pass it back to Nahum. Thank you, Hoda, for sharing some of the critical work being done at Living Well Kent. So now we're gonna be moving on to the moderated Q&A section where I'm gonna be asking the presenter some questions. So we're actually going to end the share screen and just show all of the speakers while I ask them some questions. Perfect. So my first couple of questions are going to be related to the HIV research that's being done. And here's my first question. What are factors influencing HIV research participation? I can um, take a first stab at this and I welcome um, others in the team to, to comment. Um, now, that's a really great question. And I think the factors are variable and they likely relate to the nature of the, the project, the study itself, um, but also the uh, level of engagement that goes on to uh, recruit the participants. I think there are others on this call, um, including Stefan Wallace with the UW Fred Hutch CIFAR who can speak better at this um, than I can. But I, I think, you know, it uh, is clearly the case that when the work is led from the beginning to the end by people who are affected in the communities that um, participation overall tends to be more robust, and more meaningful and so forth. So I think, um, I think there are probably lots of many um, factors that influence that, but I think one of the key ones is the amount and level and type of uh, engagement with the communities that the studies are taking place with. Does anyone else want to chime in? I agree with uh, Dr. Patel, it, you know, uh, what we have found in, in, in doing this, this work um, has, I mean, previously for any type of, you know, uh, research work uh, conducted in communities of color, uh, it has not been led by 
uh, community members or uh, you know public health professionals representing the community. I think in order for us to for any research work, I think the most important um, factor is figuring out how to connect with the communities and figuring out what the needs of the communities are even prior to doing any research work. Sometimes I think intentional, when we're intentional about our engagement um, and asking the community members what their priorities are. And then if we start doing, you know, connecting with people from there, then it would make it much easier to continue working in whatever we are trying to accomplish, especially when it comes to health education or promotion. I, I think, uh, uh, thank you, Rina and Rahel. Uh, you have uh, already touched on the major points. The only thing that I will add is, uh, you know, Harambe project was really unique in, in the way that it engaged with the uh, community. Uh, you know, the project right from the beginning uh, involved uh, the community, uh, you know, uh, leaders, community organizations, um, into the planning, uh, whereby, you know, whether it's resource allocation and decision making, you know, communities who are given a lion's share. Um, and then uh, the community organizations that uh, were involved in this project, you know, had a well established relationship and trust with their own communities that played a very important role in, you know, making this project uh, a successful one. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, uh, communities have uh, uh, many priorities of, you know, as uh, Rahel shared in the presentation. So um, uh, meeting the community where they are, you know, I, I remember one of the things that we did was actually Rahel did, uh, she conducted a focus group discussion um, uh, 10 uh, p.m. On, on Saturday night. Uh, can you imagine that's, you know, uh, it, it's a lot, the community, that was the only time that was available and, you know, convenient for our community partners and community uh, members. So we had to accommodate whatever, you know, uh, we, we were, our plan plans were just to uh, ensure that our community are feeling uh, respected and, and, and welcome in any space that we're engaging them. Thank you. Yes, thank you all for those insightful answers and shedding a light on the importance of flexibility and representation and trust. Um, my next question for the, the same Project Harambe, what do researchers need to know before approaching communities to propose research products? I think that uh, always remember that you we cannot despite what the data uh, says about a community. Uh, for example, even though HIV is one of the major issues in our community, in the East African communities affecting so many, uh, we cannot just look at that and approach communities and try to um, offer what we can do for them because communities who are disproportionately affected by other chronic illnesses, like I said in the, um, in the you know, um, in the research, you know, during my presentation, there are other chronic illnesses affecting this communities prior to that. And also there are the social determinants of health. These communities are not only affected by illnesses, but housing, food access, uh, transportation, there are so many other barriers that is affecting the community. So we always have to remember uh, when we're approaching and when we're trying to implement any type of 
uh, programs or services, we have to find out first what is the what are their priorities because nobody is going to care about sitting and learning about hiv prevention or diabetes prevention if they are if they don't have enough food to eat or if they're you know if they have other issues they have to you know they're they're facing so those are the things that we have to address before we we provide our services so you know we cannot always base our uh what we're trying to do as as researchers when they approach this communities it's not about it is about what the data says but it's all about what the the community needs are at that moment then based on that we can we you know we can address each issues and then we can get to where we want to to get and i think building relationships in that manner also build trust uh, a lot of times researchers approach communities when they do get funding and when they want to do uh you know complete their practicum or complete their research work and that is that is what we need to we need you know we need to start doing research work differently if we are like you know intentionally trying to engage and trying to uh, uh, teach people and provide information uh, and that says with with anything whether it's a diabetes prevention program or any health promotion program and and i think and that's what i would believe that every researcher need to uh, remember is like not to approach based on their own biases, but based on what the community needs are and finding that out first. Thank you. I will uh, second um, Rahel. I know other folks haven't spoken. Um, so one thing that I will add to what Rahel has already said is, you know, sometimes when we are thinking about communities, you know, we see communities as deficient, that they don't have, you know, they need something, they're lacking something. And the fact is communities are resourceful. There are people within the community who have all the skills it takes to do a research. And, and researchers should see communities as you know resourceful uh, as partners as an equal partner so uh, that's one one thing that you know researchers need to uh, understand and and if they honor and and, and consider into or look into um, the resources within the community they are uh, a, you know research goals are more likely to be successful and and when com, you know research uh, activities engage uh, communities in a very meaningful meaningful manner, uh, it's more likely to be successful. At the same time, uh, you know community should have ownership at the end you know of the at the of the end product, whereby communities can say we did this, we did that. You know they can get credit for the work they did. And another thing is, you know, resource allocation. Usually uh, what happens is, you know, research institutions go to the community, collect some information and disappear. Uh, and that should not be the case. Community should know the outcome or the end result of, of, of the research uh, activities done within the community by adequately uh, allocating resources to disseminate the findings to the community so that they know um, what you know the community is going through the, you know the findings and so that for the future they will welcome you and 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 and, and engage you uh, you know at a different level than uh, if you did not engage them uh, to begin with thank you thank you all for sharing this perspective of communities and how important it is to to get their insight. 
Um, now I'm going to swing it over to the COVID-19 folks and ask them a couple of questions. So my first question is, what are some of the challenges and successes regarding COVID-19 vaccine uptake in your community? Um, I can go first. Uh, some of the successes that we had was um, initially when um, we started doing the registration for people and like working with them through the registration process, we got a, a higher number and like a higher volume of people who were actually signing up for the vaccine, especially when we started conducting uh, vaccines in our own office. Uh, a lot of our clients who felt comfortable coming to us, it's a lot of people in their community, uh, familiar, familiar faces, um, it made them feel way more comfortable and a lot, like, a lot better about getting the actual vaccine. Um, the biggest challenge we had is just a lot of um, education around the vaccine and kind of addressing misinformation. That's been our biggest barrier that we've had so far and just the hesitancy and um, the lack of confidence in the vaccine has been our biggest challenge, but our success was also um, aiding a lot of people who probably wouldn't have been able to get the vaccine to get it. Um, yeah, mine is also similar to Hoda's. Um, I would say the challenge was um, communities were not able to access information. Uh, so because of that, they were left to make assumptions or uh, left to make decisions based on information that they heard on the grapevine. Um, so that was really a challenge. Uh, but the flip side of that, which kind of turned to success was to work with uh, people that they trust uh, and especially looking at where, um, uh, where these myths are coming from. So for example, if they, if they are very, if they're not comfortable about the vaccine for religious re uh, reasons, then uh, they will take it with, um, with more trust if uh, a religious person ex explains uh, the reason why it's safe as, com as compared to a community navigator. Uh, so we worked with uh, religious leaders. Uh, we, make sure, we made sure that they understood so that they can pass on the information to the communities. So working with people who are trusted in the community was a success. Uh, but yeah, as I said, the challenge was really making sure that communities are kept informed while they have a challenge with language and cultural barriers. And I also want to piggyback on the cultural barriers part. Uh, because just because information is translated doesn't mean that it's culturally responsive or culturally appropriate. Uh, a lot of our community, we speak face to face, uh, we have uh, in person conversations, we get information from, like Sophia said, a trusted community leaders. So just because, um, for example, a pamphlet is translated about COVID vaccine is translated to Somali doesn't necessarily mean that it's entering the Somali community and is being received by the Somali community. So we have to take that extra steps to ensure that our communities are actually getting the information and, and processing the information in a way that they are comfortable with. So, um, you know, one thing that I will say, thank you, um, uh, Sophia and, and Hoda for speaking about COVID-19 response. Um, just speaking on behalf of, I put money in a hat, so um, part of the Somali Health for Leadership, and we have done a lot of work, community work in relation, in, in relation to COVID-19. Uh, at the beginning, there were many barriers, uh, including a cultural language misinformation about COVID-19. Uh, and the nature of you know uh, of our community, they uh, tend to work in um, uh, jobs that will not allow them even to take time off or to test themselves for COVID-19. So there were many, and there were so so many information. So what Somali Health Board did was just to ensure that we advocate for uh, our community uh, needs by talking to policymakers, healthcare. Uh, institutions to ensure that services are brought within our community. And Somali Health Board has built a, a very good relationship with the community uh, over the years. And, and we tapped into that relationship uh, and trust that we, we have with the community. So um, 
we, we addressed uh, misinformation. Um, and there are many community members who are coming to our events, uh, you know, pop up uh, clinics. Uh, we established, you know, established partnerships with uh, different uh, uh, communities, different institutions, so that we can bring our resources together to ensure that our community needs are, are, are met. Um, we also engaged uh, religious leaders. You know, when communities have concerns, the first place they go to uh, are the religious institutions. So we engaged the religious leaders, you know, the sheikhs, to inform and educate uh, the community on 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 COVID nineteen uh, prevention uh, and and vaccination, address misinformation head on, and also we also used as at times information might be you know translated into into a language. There are community members who don't read, don't write. So what what did we do? We just did um, you know social media outreach. Uh, we engaged people who are, you know, from the community who have skills, who are trusted to, you know, to go on Facebook, WhatsApp, and to inform the community. Um, and that has really played a very important role in ensuring that, you know, a large number of people are, you know, testing for COVID-19 or taking COVID-19 vaccinations and, and answering their questions uh, and concerns um, uh, whenever they approach us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing some of the difficulties and successes that each of your respective organizations has had combating COVID. Um, I think we have enough time for one more question before we move on to the open Q&A. So my last question is, what is the most important thing for community leaders to do during the COVID-19 crisis? I can start with that. So um, there's just so much to do. It's difficult to kind of come up with which one is more important or most important. It all seems critical and important when you are um, in emergency mode. Uh, but having seen um, those many activities that we have been engaged in, I would say the most important would be enabling community members to access opportunities because you know we can we have been supporting with direct uh, assistance but really there is there is so much you can do it's limited people have lost so much uh, uh, but uh, there are so many resources out there with public resources from public or private sector and uh, the problem has been um, uh, community members who have been uh, financially affected by COVID-19 uh, were not really able to access those resources. One, uh, because they just didn't know about them. And two, even when they knew, uh, they weren't able to um, navigate the application process and access those grants. Uh, so we focused our energy on that. Uh, we made sure that people knew about it. We made sure that um, they need, they have all the help they need to uh, apply. Um, so um, we had three, temp three temporary staff here in the organization uh, who were working full hour to help community members access those grants. So I, I feel um, that helped uh, most community members a lot. And uh, just to give you one example, um, there was this lady who applied uh, for rental assistance and she had to, she gave her uh, email address, but because she didn't have an email, she gave uh, an email address of a friend. And this friend was not monitoring his email. So, um, the public office, uh, which was administering the uh, rental assistance, reached out to her over uh, email. Of course, she didn't see that. Uh, and then they reached out to us and said, um, this lady is not responding, what's going on? Uh, so these people who are working with us, they went to her house, knocked on the door and uh, find her sick she was sick, that's why um, she wasn't responding. And 
the guy who whose email she gave I didn't check. So they made sure that she responded and she got uh, the rental assistance. So this is just one example, but uh, what I wanted to say is um, uh, having these three people work is uh, has leveraged more, more, more funds that we could have provided uh, if we do the direct assistance ourselves. So I would say making sure that people do know about this um, assistance uh, opportunities and then uh, benefiting from those opportunities is really important. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Sophia said about um, meeting the community where they're at. Um, with me personally, I feel like what's really important for community leaders is to, I guess the first thing is just to listen to the community. Uh, I think a lot of times, especially with uh, higher up people, they kind of develop programs when they're not directly affected by these issues. And that's very difficult because you don't know exactly what the community needs. Um, I'm Somali and I live in Kent. That doesn't mean I know exactly what the Kent Somali community needs. I'm not, I know what I need, but I might not know what the broader community needs. So even when they, when people ask me about what is the Somali community, I go into that community and ask them. A lot of our programs were developed by just speaking to the community. Uh, at the beginning when there's food insecurity, like I was talking about earlier with the food boxes, um, we gave them the food boxes and we followed up with them and said, hey, what's going on? Like, how, how are you liking it? They said, you know what? We don't know how to cook with this food. So we turned around and worked internally to come up with a solution that would better fit them. There's certain things just asking community. Um, pe people don't usually just out of the blue say that they need diapers. That's a very like specific thing. It was us taking the time and listening to the community, seeing what they need. And there was a lot of people who were in need of diapers and other baby supplies. Um, so I think that's like the biggest thing is just sitting down and listening to the community. If you don't have access to that community, not just going in yourself, um, finding those trusted community leaders and working through them because they are the experts. Uh, we are not, they're the experts in their own community. So just sitting down, taking time with the community, fully listening to them and developing programs, finding funding, doing the things that they don't have access to, uh, using like the privilege that we have to be able to better um, serve them. I wanna add, uh, on what Hoda said, as uh, as a big organization, as you know, working for the YMCA is one of the largest nonprofit organizations. How I see our role is also supporting the community, the smaller community-based organization like Living Well Kent and the Ethiopian Community Center or um, the Eritrean Community Center, and you know the the different community-based organizations who are working, who are the expert, you know, uh, in providing services to these communities. And we can leverage those relationships and we can strengthen our relationship with the community-based organizations. And then we can support them in whatever their needs are, not necessarily what we have. Uh, I think the most important thing is uh, being able to uh, like Hoda said, like, you know, finding out what the community needs are, but also as the larger uh, organization, listening to the, the smaller community-based organizations that might not have the resources to provide all the services that they would like to, then we can come in and provide, be that um, capacity builders or providing, you know, the resources so that they can strengthen uh you know uh, they could advance you know their their uh their work in these communities thank you yeah, one more thing that i will add is um as you have said when this issue they when there's a problem you know communities uh come to the community organizations, community-based organizations. So Somali Health Board's work was geared toward this health-related, uh, um, you know, education, health outreach. Um, however, when COVID hit, uh, the, the, the need has changed at the beginning, uh, whereby there are people did not have enough food, especially elderly uh, people who could not go out. 
um, people who are not able to pay for, the, for their rent. So uh, we, uh, you know, spoke to the donors and ensure that, you know, they understand funds can be, you know, geared towards to the uh, immediate need. And what we did was just to ensure that, you know, uh, people are able, you know, uh, have uh, 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 their, pay, their rent taken care of, uh, they are eating well. So um, the board met and, and used, allocated some money to ensure that, you know, those needs are, are met to ensure that uh, our community members are not suffering uh, at this difficult time. Thank you all for sharing some of those really informative answers on what community leaders can do during the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so now in our closing minutes, I'm going to open it up to the audience to ask a couple of questions to the speakers. Uh, so just please put your questions in the chat and I'll read it out loud. And it looks like I already have a couple of questions, so I'll start with those. Um, the first question is, how can healthcare workers not specifically serving the East African community be better service providers to those navigating the healthcare system? And how can we provide more culturally relevant care on an individual level? And I'll post it in the chat because that was a bit lengthy. Uh, I will, um, I can take first stab at it, I think. One of my thoughts is honestly, it's um, the thought is welcome, but the sentiment is welcome, but it's high time for those of us who aren't from the community to step down and allow that space to be occupied by um, healthcare workers, healthcare providers who belong to the community and are um, very apt and capable of doing. So I, I think it's it's one of those, really critical responses that kind of ask us to think a lot harder about what our position is and to acknowledge that the, the answer may be that you're not the right person to serve. I agree with Rena. I think one of, uh, one of the major barriers for a lot of healthcare providers representing from the community is not having the opportunity to be uh, to be to, to serve in you know uh, find position usually I mean we do not like you know there are enough knowledge in professions and educated people in the community but those people don't necessarily have the ability to have to you know to to become a healthcare provider. There is not. Um, I have you know I have. I mean I'm not a, a physician, but as a public health professional, I've been in spaces where people talk about my own community, but I didn't have a voice. And that is so important. Representation matters. So I think people can have, you know, you can't learn to have, uh, you cannot be culturally competent. You can have, you know, you can be called, you know, you can have cultural humiliation, but you, you can't have, you can't be culturally competent to work in communities that you're not from. But if you give the opportunity for the for the, pro, the providers or community members who do have the knowledge, who do know the barrier, you know what barriers and who do know what is affecting the community, if they have the opportunity to work uh, in, in their own community, you know, that would be the best way. I think uh, the healthcare system, the reason why it is so broken is there isn't much representation and there is a disconnect to how you know how you can provide services to you know to community pe people who are navigating who are trying to navigate the healthcare system because without understanding the culture 
without understanding what what barriers are affecting this community without you know that takes you know that that takes a lot of work that's not something that you can learn in school that's something that you know you can learn and you can help but the community uh people have to lead the work Uh, I want to add my thought here. So I do agree with Dr. Rina and Rahel um, that community members are really the best to serve their own. Uh, but we live in an imperfect world, right? So yes, that's right. But uh, yeah, where we are now, uh, everyone who is from East Africa, uh, when they need services, health services, um, they don't get um, a health worker from East Africa. So in this situation, I think, um, yes, you will never be as culturally competent as someone from East Africa, but you will still need to be very deliberate uh, to learn about the culture and give a better service. So, um, yeah, I'm agreeing with them, but I'm also recognizing the fact that there are too many out there already who are not from East Africa and who are providing services for East Africans. So in that scenario, uh, please be deliberate to learn about the culture and, uh, and also recognize that everyone doesn't have the same culture. Uh, what people say, what people do uh, is influenced by their, up, their, upbringing, their upbringing, their culture. So I've had a number of uh, health workers calling our offices and asking, you know, I have a patient, uh, they won't name names, but in general, from your community, I have been faced with this situation and what can I do? Uh, so I, I do appreciate that because uh, at least they are making an effort. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. I think uh, the only thing that I'll add is uh, Sophia has, say, has said it, um, uh, and Wina and Rahel said it very well. Uh, there's not, there's no problem working with, um, you know. Uh, with East African uh, communities, even though you are not from them. Uh, the only thing that I will say is listen and be ready to learn. Uh, not only, you know, East Africa is very diverse and live alone East Africa, even among the Somali communities, they are very diverse in terms of the region they come from. So, um, uh, and when it comes to, you know, for instance, in Kenya, there are 42 countries I mean, 42 tribes with different languages, same case Ethiopia. Um, and, and that can be, you know, very complicated. So don't, don't generalize, be ready to learn where you don't understand, you ask questions. Um, if, if there are people who are from, uh, from the community who can, of, uh, who can do maybe the same job, for instance, if you are doing some community outreach or some community education on a topic. You have in your workforce somebody who speaks the language. Don't try to facilitate that discussion. You know, give empower the person who is from the community to lead that project in 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 communicating to the community instead of you you know speaking to the community and using a translator. That's one instance. So. Um, be flexible with, with whatever you're doing and be ready to laugh, that's it, thank you. And uh, one more thing I would like to add, I think everyone pretty much covered exactly how I was thinking, um, but just addition to that, um, aside from just taking a step back and realizing that you're not able to serve this community, uplift the voices that are able to serve that community as well. Bring them into that space. Um, if you have a job, say you're a nurse and there's a job opening and you serve a lot of East African populations, you know, may, maybe make a focus on hiring somebody that's East African and giving access to those people that can serve those communities instead of trying to adjust yourself to serve those communities. Now, may I add one more thing? 
think this is similar to a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement in that those of us who don't belong to the Black or African, African-American community, our role is to think critically about ourselves as allies and to think of ways that we could influence change. Um, and that may be helping to advocate at a policy level. Maybe that's our space, our role. You know, for example, um, the Somali Health Board has been with partnership with other organizations trying to get a lot of change for um, the foreign medical graduates to be able to practice in our US healthcare system more easily than the current restrictive system. You know, that is a good instance of role that us allies can play um, uh, rather than necessarily focusing on, you know, how do I better serve directly the patient or a client in front of me. I think thinking at a bigger systems level and um, helping to influence change is also helpful in addition to what others have said. Thank you everyone for these diverse yet cohesive answers. Um, I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, and then after that, we're gonna be heading into closing. So this final question states, listening to the speakers today, it's clear that this work is being planned, launched and managed by providers in the East African community. With so many service providers in the region, what would you say to those larger organizations who are not yet active in the East African community? I think we're held. Sorry, I think Rahel um, touched on it earlier a little bit, speaking about being in the YMCA big um, entity and um, like partnering with smaller CBOs because the YMCA is not in the community as much as the smaller CBOs are. And it doesn't have to even be uh, strict um, organizations, just um, there's a lot of community leaders that are in like community groups and just um, non-funded spaces but also that like just not developing the work on your end, but making sure you go to people who are actually in the community, those organizations, those community leaders, the community, the natural um, community navigators. Um, and before even starting any work, making sure you fully understand and what the community actually needs at that point. Just having that initial step of making that, putting in a lot of effort to building that bridge before you even start working on anything. And what I wanted to add is also that we're currently uh, trying to work on creating a coalition uh, of healthcare providers and, you know, uh, bigger institutions to come together in representing the different communities and also different organizations, not necessarily um, uh, who are our partners currently, but organizations who are in these communities to come together as a coalition so that we can come up what, you know, uh, what would be the best way to provide, whether it be social services or healthcare services or creating a way to, uh, to make it easier for community members to navigate the healthcare system, uh, I think coming up as a coalition, we will be able to, for one thing, we won't duplicate so many things that we're doing currently right now, trying to work in the same community with different organizations. So I think coming together would eliminate, instead of uh, duplicating what each other's are doing, we're going to come up with um, different ideas, but to benefit the communities in different ways. Like, for example, you know, uh, the YMCA, we do have, you know, so we do provide social services we, for youth, mental health uh, services, counseling, uh, you know, housing for unhoused, you know, youth population. And we'll also have the chronic disease prevention uh, programs you know, research-based programs. So we have all these programs that we do own, but we are not necessarily in every community. So what we can do is uh, we come together, we collaborate with other organizations as a coalition 
we can present those programs and services and say, what would be the best way to provide this services for the community that you, we're, you know, you're serving. I think that would be the best way to start, you know, helping communities because uh, whoever asked that question, there are so many uh, organizations and providers who are trying to help the East African community, other uh, BIPOC communities, but there is no, I think we need like, you know, we need to come together. We need to figure out a way coming together so that we can be more effective and we could be more intentional and also provide sustainable programs and services. And I think that's how I see uh, moving forward as we're trying to navigate this challenging time. So, the the only thing that I will add is uh, what has already been said is uh, there are some instances where there are community based organizations who are from the community are providing services. And you will see at times where, you know, community, you know, organizations that are outside of the community compete for the same resources, uh, whether it's grants um, and in that kind of situation, I think there are two ways that they can do. One is just leave that, you know, source of funding or grants to community, community-based community organization to pursue and, you know, support them. The other thing is partner with the community-based organizations to ensure that, um, you know, the, the funding that's available, you know, goes to the community and, and, and supplements and support, uh, you know, what, what has already been done within the community. So um, if there are community-based organizations that are from the community, you know, instead of uh, competing for the same resources, um, it's a good idea to ensure that um, resources are, are given to people who are more appropriate to serve the community. Thank you, Dr. Kwame. Thank you everyone for these insightful answers and guidance on what some of these large organizations can do to be active in the East African community. Um, I think we are almost out of time, so we can actually move on to our closing segment. So I just wanna say thank you for joining us, everyone who's attending live in the Zoom meeting, uh, watching the YouTube stream live, or who's gonna be watching the recording later. Appreciate everyone who's able to watch this and important work and uh, spread the message. And I also wanna take a brief moment to thank all of the speakers that attended. This couldn't be possible without them and all of the collaborating orgs. Uh, you can watch the recording of this event on this link, YouTube link slash YMCA of Greater Seattle. You can also contact Rahel Schwartz for any questions that you have. And to support this work that the YMCA is doing, you can uh, go on that link, www.seattleymca.org slash donate slash. And here are also some links of our collaborating organizations, including the UW Center for AIDS Research, Ethiopian Community in Seattle, and Living Well Kent. And they're also posted in the chat. So thank you all for joining. Mama. Thank you, everyone.